Okay, um, so thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thanks everyone for um, making the time. I know that we're all somehow somehow busier um, than usual, but but in a in a sort of less fun way. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about joint work with with Lawrence Barrett. And um, although, to be fair, I'm going to probably spend most of the hour talking around our project, and I'll probably only get to what we're actually, what we've actually done in the last sort of third of the talk. Um, so I, I sort of seem to have structured this talk in in, in sort of three parts, um, which are which are sort of independent but related. And although I'm kind of questioning the wisdom of having done things this way at this point, I think uh, one of the benefits is that if you kind of, you know, get bored and stop listening halfway through, then you can kind of jump back in later on uh, when, when the next part starts. Um, so anyway, uh, and yeah, as I said, please feel free to, to pop, you know, answer, ask any questions or comments or anything. Um, okay, so let me, I guess, start by telling you my goal. So my goal, I guess, over the next hour is to try to explain to you uh, what the information that's encoded in the following pictures. There's two pictures. One is a picture of tangent curves in degree two, and one is a picture of tangent curves in degree three. And my my hope is that by the end, um, I'll have been able to under, uh, to explain to you, you know, what's going on here, what these arrows mean, and, and where these numbers come from. Um, so we'll see if we get there. Um, so this 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 these pictures that I've shown you these are pictures of of a theorem which is really classical in in character in the sense that this theorem could have been stated in in the 19th century. Um, as far as we're aware, it hasn't been stated up until now. We weren't able to find any result of this form in the literature. Um, but what's interesting, and and this is I guess emblematic I think of a lot of this field, is that the proof really hinges on on really modern techniques. I mean techniques that weren't even really around e even ten years ago. You know, so it uses things like log gromov witten theory, log deformation theory, intersection theory, localization, tropical geometry, and and so on and so on. Um, and so I think this is this is certainly not the first time this has happened, where old results are proved using new techniques. And so hopefully this can be viewed as a kind of continuation of this tradition. Um, I need to begin though by apologizing for the for the experts in the audience. So um, I suppose that something that everyone knows is that you know giving a math seminar, one of the reasons it's hard is because you don't know your audience necessarily and you don't know what you know what they know or what they care about. Uh, and I, I think that's even harder with a, with a sort of online seminar. So I, I've decided for this talk not to assume that you know or care necessarily about gromov witten theory or enumerative geometry or anything like that. So I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about these things. So I apologize um, for those of you who, who already do have that motivation. Um, but if, if you do want to, you know, separately after this, have a longer discussion to go into the details, then I'm, I'm you know, more than happy to, to do that. Um, OK, so let me start by telling you, uh, I guess, what the types of questions we're interested in, 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 in taking a look at. So this would be what I would call enumerative geometry with tangency conditions. So the story starts, as stories often do, with Bezu's theorem. So here's a very, very simple example. If I pick two smooth conics in the plane, then you know, we all learned in kindergarten that they intersect in four points, right? Um, but of course, that's only strictly speaking true if you count them with the correct multiplicities, okay? And of course, something that you sort of notice is that if I chose my conics, if I chose C1 and C2 generically, then in that case, all the multiplicities are going to be one. OK, so they will just intersect transversely in four points. And I have some picture like this. Um, but of course, for certain special choices of C1 or C2, this might not be the case. OK, so in this in this picture at the top, you can imagine just sort of sliding C1 over to the right of it. And, and then because I'm not very good at drawing, it seems that I've also rotated C2. But let, let's ignore that. Um, and, you know, for certain special choices, you can have fewer points. OK, and then, of course, by Bezu's theorem, they're going to have to have larger multiplicities. And so what we're going to do, so, so in this case, I would say, we would say that, that C1 and C2 are tangent to each other, okay, because they're tangent at this point. You probably can't see my mouse, is that correct? Can anyone see the cursor? We do see your cursor. You, you do see the cursor. Okay, great, great. So, um, so of course, they're tangent together um, at, at this point. And so, okay, so, you know, so far, so, so trivial. So what, what I'm going to do now out of this kind of very basic geometry is I'm going to cook up a problem in enumerative geometry which involves conics and tangencies. Okay, um, so the setup is the following. So I'm going to fix five smooth conics in the plane. Okay, I'll call them C1 through C5. I'm going to fix those once and for all. 
Uh, I, I'm going to assume they're in general position. Let me not, you know, dwell too much on what that means. It just means that they're sufficiently generic in the, in the sort of configuration space of five conics. Um, and then the question I'm going to ask is, I'm going to I'm going to try to consider conic C, which are tangent to all five of these conics, C1 through C5, simultaneously. Okay. And I claim that when I do that, when I consider that special class of conics, I actually just get finitely many. Okay. So let me try to sort of justify. Uh, why that's true. So it's it's helpful to think of this as a problem in, in, in moduli theory. So you can consider the moduli space of all smooth conics, okay? And this is a dense open inside some projective space, right? Because this is the, you know, this is the complete linear system of conics inside P2, right? So this thing is a six-dimensional vector space, so it gives me a five-dimensional projective space. Um, and of course, you know, this, this space includes degenerate objects such as double lines or unions of two lines, um, but generically, the generic elements of this of this space will be smooth, okay? And and I will let you denote the the locus of such of such smooth conics. This is just some Zariski open subset inside P five, okay? And as we've as we've just said, so if I choose a if I choose a general element of this moduli space, meaning just a general smooth conic in the plane, then it's going to intersect each of the C I transversely, right? In four distinct points. But what we could do instead is we could look at the special locus, okay? So, so some sub some subset living inside U consisting of those conics which are tangent to CI, okay? So here's a fact, and I, I think this fact is very plausible, even if you don't quite see the proof, is that this, this locus is a hypersurface, okay? So being tangent to a fixed conic is a co-dimension one condition inside the space of um, all smooth conics, okay? So uh, one way that you can, I mean, yeah, probably probably this is not worth sort of saying, but one way you can think about this is if you go back to this picture, um, if I want to make this guy tangent to, if I want to make C1 tangent to C2, then one way to think about it is I'm forcing two of the intersection points to come together. So you have this space of sort of four points, and then I force two of them to come together, and then I get a, a tangent conic. Okay, that's one way you can think about it, roughly speaking. So, Okay, so we have these loci VI, and we have one of them for every one of our conics CI, right? So we, we started with these five conics, C1 through C5, and for each of them, we have some hypersurface, which consists of the conics which, which, which satisfy this tangency condition. So now, of course, if we want to consider the conics which are tangent to all of them simultaneously, then we just need to take the intersection, okay? And now, of course, you see why I expect to find only finitely many, because this, this person U was a five-dimensional space, right? It was an open inside P5, and I'm intersecting five hypersurfaces. So, you know, as long as my intersection is, um, is reasonable, as long as my intersection is transverse or dimensionally transverse, then I expect to get a finite number of such objects, okay? And so then an obvious question arises, which is how many are there, right? How many are, um, yeah. So I will sort of give away the answer. Hold on, let's see if I can build, build some suspense here. Du, 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 drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. There we go. So the answer is 3,264. So this is the number of smooth plane conics tangent to five fixed conics, okay? And some of you may have seen this number before. Some of you may know the story very well. This is a very famous number, I think, in enumerative geometry. And this number was computed in the, in the 19th century, in fact. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how you would prove this, because I think it's actually quite instructive for the for the general uh, for, for the types of arguments that we like to make in this field, even even up until this day. Um, so the proof goes as follows. So previously we were working inside this space U of smooth conics, okay? But let me just enlarge my kind of field of vision a bit. Let me work inside the space P5 of all conics, okay? The reason I want to do that is because P5 is compact. Its intersection theory is sort of well-defined and, you know, or at least well-behaved. And so I can, you know, maybe understand things a bit better there. Um, so it turns out if you take if you take the closure of this of this original space, VI, inside P5, so that's still a hypersurface, and it turns out it actually has degree six. Okay, so I'm not I'm not going to explain why this is, but of course this P5 here has homogeneous coordinates which correspond to the coefficients of the um, of the equation defining your conic, and if you just you know plug in what being tangent to say CI says, it will turn out to give you a degree six um, relation between the uh, well sorry a degree six equation involving those homogeneous coordinates involving those coefficients. Um, Okay, so I have five of these, and I want to intersect them, right? So of course, you know, uh, intersecting six hyper, uh, sorry, excuse me, intersecting five degree six hyperplanes, hypersurfaces rather, in P5, 
gives me 6 to the 5, which is 7,776 points. Now, the um, eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that this number here is not the same <laughs> as this number here, right? So, um, so this is the wrong answer, okay? And, um, and the person who got it wrong was this person, Steiner, who I think was the first person to, uh, to pose this question. He gave 7776 as the answer, um, which is wrong. OK, and the, 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 the result, the, 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 uh, the answer was corrected later on. Um, but let's ask the question, why is it wrong? OK, and um, the reason is because of this little thing that I said about how I only wanted to consider smooth conics. OK, here we took the intersection inside all of P5, and that included a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't want. In particular, this complete linear system includes an entire locus of double lines, right? So it's a whole P2 living in this P5 consisting of doubled lines. And if you think about what it means to be tangent, you know, just in terms of equations, those double lines will always be tangent to every conic, okay? So when I took the intersection of these, um, sorry, I'm, I'm going to try and stop going back and forth so much. Let me just, just so when I, when I take the intersection of these hypersurfaces, when I took that intersection inside P5, meaning with the closure, I ended up not actually with a finite number of points, but with a whole two-dimensional locus, okay, which is this locus of double lines. And somehow, because I'm only interested in um, counting smooth conics, okay, I would like to remove this contribution somehow. And this is what something called the excess intersection formula does for you. Okay, so the excess intersection formula allows you to make sense of the contribution of these doubled lines. And once you make sense of that contribution, you could remove it. So it turns out, and this is this is really, a, you know, these days this is a calculation involving churn classes and 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 things like that. Um, it turns out that the contribution of these doubled lines is given by this quantity here. When you subtract it off, if I've you know uh, written this down correctly, um, you should get three thousand two hundred and sixty-four. Okay. Um, so let me say a little bit more about this excess intersection formula, and then I'll then I'll stop for some questions. Um, so, 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 what is this mysterious thing that I've that I've written down here? So, here's one way you can think about it. Um, so, remember, I have these five hypersurfaces living in P5. Sorry, there there should be a, a closure here. Um, I, okay, I'm replacing the hypersurfaces by their closures inside P5. So, each of those has an embedding, right? And because this guy's degree six, we know that when I push forward its fundamental class, I just get six times the fundamental, well, six times the class of a hyperplane in the in in the cohomology or in the Chow of P5. And then therefore, you know, uh, intersection theoretically, if I just look at the product of the classes, I just get six to the five times the class of a point, right? So this is H to the five, of course. Now, this is a product which is happening on P5 itself. But the, what the refined intersection product does, and this is, I think, due to Fulton McPherson, um, there may have been precursors in other contexts, but at least the version that we use these days is due to these people. What it does is it allows us to express this class here which just lives on the ambient space P5 as a push forward from the actual intersection of these hypersurfaces. So let me just say what that means. What it says is that there exists some class on the actual physical intersection of these hypersurfaces that we started with, which pushes forward to give me the, uh, the intersection on P5. So you can think of this in a way as localizing the class to the actual intersection, right? So this class here doesn't really live on any sub variety of P5, it's just a class on P5. I can't really say anything more about it. And what this what this construction gives you is a way to force that class to lie actually on the intersection. Okay. And the amazing thing about this is that it actually carries more information because in this case, this you know, whereas P5 is is sort of rationally connected or it's connected, you know, it's only got a single class in its top cohomology. It's just this point class. On the other hand, this intersection has many connected components, as we've just said. So it has these this whole two-dimensional locus that consists of double lines, and then it has some isolated points which correspond to smooth conics. And so one way you can think about this construction is it gives a decomposition of this class into contributions coming from the various components. Okay. And that's strictly more information. And in particular, in, in this in this situation, you can make sense of what it means to uh to talk about the contribution of these double lines. Okay. And this this is a very uh common feature that we encounter in enumerative geometry is that you have some space and it has a bunch of components and you want to understand your total integral or total you know intersection product as some contribution from those various components okay and this is a kind of body of uh, of, of machinery that's been developed to, to to make sense of this and to help you do this um 
Okay, so, so in any case, so the, this is the sort of flavor of the questions that we're interested in, this conic question. So you fix some collection of divisors. In this case, it, it was these conics, C1 through C5. And then you want to count curves which have fixed orders of tangency to these divisors. Okay, and these are the kinds of questions that enumerative geometers are, are interested in, in talking about. Um, okay, so before I move on, let me just pause to see if there are any questions or comments. No? Okay. Um, sorry, one. Oh, I have completely lost. Ah, there we go. Okay, we're back. Okay, cool. So, so, so far, so classical. Okay, now I want to move into sort of more modern terrain. So, so I'm going to talk a bit about logram of Witten theory. Um, so the idea is that we want to do enumerative geometry with tangencies, um, but we want to do it from the point of view of Grom of Witten theory. So let me just um, give you a very brief sort of overview of what, of, of what this thing is. So the setup, uh, yeah, let's go down to that. So the setup for Grom of Witten theory is as follows. So you fix some ambient space that you're interested in looking at. Um, and the only thing you really require is that it's smooth and projective. Okay, so, you know, in, in our situation, a lot of the time, it's just going to be some projective space, like P2 or P3 or something, okay? But whatever ambient space you fix, you can then associate to that some space of stable maps, okay? And this is written like this. And what it is, is it's a moduli space of these objects here. So it's, it's, a, it's a morphism from some uh, uh, nodal projective curve, C, into X, um, together with a bunch of markings on C. Okay, so the picture, you know, uh, I have a kind of, I guess, you know, uh, if I'm working over the complex numbers, then the sort of picture of the C is something like this. It's some Riemann surface. In this case, it's genus three. Uh, it's allowed to have nodal singularities, so it might have a bunch of different components, um, but, you know, they're all joined up in some way. And then I also have, in this case, two marked points, P1 and P2, which are just distinct smooth points on the curve. Okay. Um, and this morphism is required to be what's called stable, which I'm, I'm not really going to talk about what that means, but one thing it implies is that this moduli space is separated, so limits are, are unique. Um, so this is a this is a moduli space of stable maps, um, and usually you, you fix some of the sort of discrete data for the problem. So for example, this G here is, uh, is the genus of the source curve, so you can just fix that a priori because this is constant in families, so you just kind of cut out some, some open and closed uh, substack. Um, and then similarly, this, this thing beta here is an element of, of the second homology group of X, and you can think of it as the degree of the map or the class of the curves that you're considering, if you like. Okay. Um, okay, so this moduli space exists. It's a um, Deleen-Mumford stack, uh, an orbifold if you prefer. It's not always smooth, so it can have many components of different dimensions. In nice cases, it's smooth, but you know, not, not always. In fact, not, not very often. Um, but nevertheless, it's very well understood. The deformation theory of these objects are very well understood. Um, so one way, one way that you can think about this is that it's a compactification of the space of parameterized smooth curves in X. Okay, so I can have some, some smooth curve with just some embedding into X. I can consider the space of such things, but that space is not compact, right? Because um, you know, a, a, limit of, a limit of a smooth curve might not be smooth. Um, you know, various bad things can happen. And so this space is just one way that you can compactify that, that space, okay? Um, and just want to point out, because this will be important later on, is this map F doesn't need to be an embedding um, in general. It doesn't even need to be, uh, uh, what's the word? It doesn't even need to be sort of, you know, birational onto its image or anything like that. It can be a covering map of, on, over its image, or, you know, a lot of things can happen in this situation. Okay, and this is this is both a kind of, uh, I mean, th this is good in some ways because it creates a very robust theory, but it's bad in other ways because it, it means that, you know, um, it's harder to interpret uh, these as sort of curves inside X. Okay, so there are sort of benefits and drawbacks to this fact. Um, okay, so, God, my handwriting got really bad here. So this is our, okay, so this is our moduli space of curves in X. Okay, so this is the analog of the space U of smooth conics that we had before. And just like before, we want to somehow uh, use this moduli space to get some numbers, okay? So to get some enumerative invariants. Um, and so how do we do this? So we, we impose some conditions in order to cut down the moduli space to a finite collection of points, right? So previously we had this space of conics and we imposed these tangency conditions and that cut down the moduli space. Um, another thing you can do uh, apart from tangency conditions is what are called incidence conditions. So you require that your curve, or in this case, your map, but you know, we think of it as a curve, intersects some chosen sub-variety of your target. 
Okay, so for example, um, if X is P2 and Z is just some point, right, then I can try to consider uh, curves which pass through that point. And that's going to cut down the dimension when I do that, because of course, you know, not every curve is going to pass through that point. Um, so one way that you can you can impose these kind of conditions in, in the framework of, of gromov witten theory, in the framework of stable maps, is to use what are called evaluation maps. So for every, so if you remember, if I just kind of scroll back a bit to my picture of a stable map, there were these sort of mysterious marked points that were floating around on my curve. I didn't say very much about them. So this is what they're used for. So my curve has a bunch of points on it, let's say P1 through Pn, and there's an evaluation map which takes a uh, stable map and sends it to um, just F of Pi. Okay, so just the value of the stable map at that point to Pi. So Given these morphisms, what I can do is I can, if I, so, oops, sorry, so if I have some, some chosen sub-variety of my target, I can just take the pre-image, okay? And that, that is literally the locus of stable maps, which send PI to Z, okay? And that's going to, in general, define some sub-variety of, uh, of this moduli space, NGM bar X beta, okay? Um, and so we can impose these conditions on every mark point, uh, well, you know, we can impose one such condition on each marking, um, and form the intersection, right? So the intersection of all of these guys, which cohomologically speaking, at least if everything is transverse, is given by the following um, integral, right? So I'm interpreting these now as cohomology classes. If you like, you can interpret them as, as, as Chow classes, and then this is just some intersection product going on here, and you can avoid the integral. But if you interpret them as cohomology classes, then, then it's something like this. Um, and so this gives you a number, and that number is called a gromov witten invariant, okay? And it's, it is a a count of curves satisfying some conditions. Um, but of course, you have to be a little bit careful what you mean by curve and, and what you mean by you know, conditions. So we interpret curves as meaning these stable maps, and, and they might look very different from embedded curves. So if you want to compare it to the kind of classical picture that I was telling you beforehand, that might be a little bit complicated. And we're going to see examples of, of making this comparison uh, a little bit later on. Um, in any case, this sort of, I guess, in uh, illustrates a sort of general principle, which is that enumerative geometry is, is the same thing as performing intersection theory on moduli spaces, okay, which is, this is what we've been doing. And um, one thing you might need, or one thing you probably do need in order to, in order to do this is for your moduli space to be compact or proper. Otherwise, um, when you cut down to get a to get a to get a zero cycle that zero cycle might not consist of finitely many points for example it could consist of infinitely many points so in order to count you you really want your space to be proper and you also need some sort of um some smoothness hypothesis or uh, or in in general you won't have smoothness but you'll have something called virtual smoothness which i'm not i mean although it is central to the theory i'm not going to touch on it too much um today um okay so are there questions about this Okay, so um, right, so as I've said, so sometimes these gromov witten invariants will coincide with the sort of classical counts, meaning that you know um, some of some stable maps really do look like embedded curves in the sense that the maps are you know basically finite, or you can view them as the, norm the normalization of some embedded curve, something like that. So in some situations, some nice situations, these numbers defined by integrating on this moduli space really do give the classical counts. Um, but in other cases, they don't. Okay, but but even when they don't, it's very interesting trying to relate the two together. Okay, and it, and not not just interesting, but actually very powerful. You can prove classical results that you weren't able to prove before using this. Um, so yeah, okay, sorry. So I'm repeating myself a bit here. So yeah, so there's a recursive structure of the moduli space, which makes it possible to prove a lot of deep results. And so I'll just give one example of this. So this is a theorem of Kinsevich uh, in the 90s. Um, so the question is the following. So if I look at if I look at rational plane curves of degree d, uh, then that 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 family is a 3d minus one dimensional family. Okay. Um, this is some you know some calculation that you could do. So I'm now looking at rational curves here. So of course in general they're going to be singular if the degree is you know at least three or something. Um, so I look at rational plane curves, they move in a 3D minus one dimensional family, and so I can cut down that, that family by imposing that they pass through 3D minus one general points. And when I do that, I expect to get a number, okay? So very simple case, when D is one, it's just asking for how many lines are there through two points, which I guess we all know. Um, for example, when D is three, it's asking for rational cubics passing through eight points. In this case, the answer is 12. The, the number of such cubics is 12. Um, and so, you know, this is a question, this is called the characteristic number question. It had been uh, considered for a very long time. 
Um, but up until, you know, the 80s or the 90s, we only knew the answer, I think, up to about D equals six or seven. The numbers get very large very quickly, and we really didn't know really anything, I think, in general about these numbers. And then uh, Konsevich came along and using the machinery of stable maps, he was able to give a complete solution in all degrees to this problem. He gives a recursive formula for calculating these numbers in terms of the previous numbers, which just completely killed uh, the whole problem, basically. So this is a very, uh, you know, powerful theory, and there's many examples of this. And, um, and you know, like I said, I guess I, I guess I view the project that I'm going to, going to talk about later as some very small contribution to this tradition of using modern techniques to answer uh, classical problems. Um, okay, so this is so far this is all about just ordinary Gromov Witten theory. Um, now what I want to do is I want to go back to talking about tangency conditions. So I want to incorporate tangencies into the framework of Gromov Witten theory. So how am I going to do this? So um, so first of all, I'm going to fix some hypersurface D living inside X. Um, for, for this talk, we can just assume that D is always going to be smooth. Okay, you, you, you can assume more general, you can work in more general situations like normal crossings or something, but for today I'm just going to assume it's smooth. Um, and I want to talk about curves which are all stable maps which are tangent to D. So how do I do that? Um, so as always in, in, in the space of stable maps, you have to rely on your marked points. Okay, so if you remember, I had these marked points on my source curve. And what I want to do is I want to impose tangency of the map to the divisor at the point PI. Okay, so um, maybe I should just say a little bit about what I mean by that. So if you, if you think about it, um, local to some point pi, I just have some map from basically a smooth curve into x, okay? And um, there's some equation, some local equation for the divisor, right, on, on x, let's call it s, and I can pull back that equation along the map. And for example, if I want my curve, if I want my point pi to map into d, then when I pull back the equation of d, I better get some power of the equation of pi, okay? Uh, or at least something that's divisible by the equation of pi. And then when we talk about tangency orders, we, we're ba what we basically mean is I want to, for example, pull back the equation of D and get the equation of PI squared. That would be tangency to order two, for instance, things like this. OK, so I want to impose some tangency orders to the map at the point PI. Um, OK, so how are we going to do this? So the, the, the sort of the I guess the way that we play this game is we decide at the beginning, OK, I want to be tangent to order three at this point, order four at this point, you know, order five at this point. And then we consider a moduli space given to us by that, you know, uh, um, by that condition. OK, so from the very beginning, we fix this data, right, just some partition of, of this quantity here, which is, of course, the the numerical, you know, expected intersection number of the curve with the with the divisor. Right. So whatever the whatever the intersection should be, it should sum to give me this. So I fix some partition of this number, and then I want to consider maps which have these tangencies at the at the corresponding markings. Okay, so let's just do an example. Uh, so example would be x x is just p three, uh, and d is just a hyperplane. Okay, and beta, which was the curve class, just five times a line. So I'm just looking at degree five curves in p three, um, and I could consider the following partition, for instance. So let's say I have two markings, uh, and three three plus two is five. So that's all good. And then the curves that I'm going to want to parameterize are going to look something like this. OK, so this is supposed to be uh, this this side is supposed to be sort of a bit sharper than this side somehow to indicate that it's tangent to a higher order. OK, so these are the types of things that I want to try and parameterize. Um, so indeed, I want to define some moduli space of relative stable maps, which will parameterize these kind of things. Um, and what do we want that moduli space to, to, to satisfy? Well, as before, if we want to do intersection theory on it, we want some compactness and we want some smoothness, okay, at least in some in some sense. And so a question, and it might seem it might seem that there's nothing to do, but this is actually quite a difficult question, is how do you actually define this space? Okay. So in some cases it's very easy. So if you're so remember, we have this map F, which goes from my curve into my target. And if the pre-image of the divisor just consists of finitely many points, then it's kind of easy, right? We know what we need to do because we've said that I want, you know, to have tangency alpha one with respect to P1, alpha two with respect to P2, and so on. So we just require that, you know, of these points in F inverse D, all of them are marked um, and that the contact order is as is specified by the initial data, which was this alpha here. Okay, so that's fine and that's all well and good. And that defines for you some subspace of the space of stable maps. Um, but the problem, of course, is that that subspace is not compact, right? Because this condition, 
is not an is not a well sorry it's not a closed condition it is an open condition so meaning like it, it can it can very well be that i have some um some stable map which only intersects d in finitely many points but as i degenerate it as i pass to some limit it can end up falling inside the divisor right so in the limit you can have whole components of a curve mapping into d I have some picture like this and in that situation it's a little bit less clear um what you want to, you know, if I give you a stable map that looks like this, when do you want to consider it as being in this space, in the space of relative stable maps, and when do you not want to consider it as being in this space? It might seem very obvious, but it's, it's you know, if you want to have good properties of this modular space, it's not at all clear what the definition should be. Um, the problem, of course, is that here, if I pull back, you know, if I look at this component that's inside the divisor and I pull back the equation of the divisor, it vanishes identically on the components. So you can no longer measure tangency order at these internal markings. And so one thing you would like is a way to keep track of these tangency orders, even as the curve falls inside the divisor. OK. Um, so there are several different solutions to this problem, which have been proposed over the last 20 years, and they're all interrelated and they all complement one another. Um, I'm just going to talk about, I guess, the sort of modern approach um, which is log stable maps. And of course, as we know, modern doesn't always mean best. Um, but in this case, I'm I'm liable to, to claim that it is the best approach so far, at least, to this problem. Um, OK, so so the idea is the following. Um, so as we said, when, when my curve falls inside the divisor, I lose access to this tangency information. So what I want to do is I want to attach some extra structure to the curve and to the target in order to allow us to make sense of this tangency. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the definite, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, one second. Yeah, okay, that's all fine. Um, so what is that extra structure? It's something called a log structure. Um, now, I'm kind of guessing that a lot of you have, have seen the definition of a log structure in seminars before. Uh, and I bet that almost all of you can't remember what the definition was, right? And, um, you know, it's unfortunate because log structures are actually really wonderful things, um, but, you know, the, the initial definition seems very obscure and it's hard to get a feeling for, for, for what it's actually encoding. So I'm going to give a very unorthodox definition. This is never the definition that's given in any textbooks, but it is equivalent to the ordinary definition. It's equivalent by a, a paper of Born and Vistoli. Um, which is now, usually this paper is now cited as being a folk, you know, it, I mean, people don't cite the paper, they just say this is a folklore result, but, but it really is in, in this paper. And so they say that a log structure is given by the following bit of data. Okay, it's two pieces of data. Um, the first piece is a sort of discrete bit, which is a constructible sheaf of monoids on the, on the, on X. Okay, so by monoid here, I mean um, basically, basically an abelian group, except that I don't require inverses to exist. So the, the best examples of monoids are rational polyhedral cones, right? Or the, the integral points of rational polyhedral cones. Okay, so you know we I have, I have addition, I have an identity, but I don't necessarily have inverses because I don't, you know, it might it might be strictly convex. Okay, so um, so I have a constructible sheaf of such monoids, and this is in a sense kind of combinatorial, and you know it's not quite combinatorial, I guess, because it has a, you know has this stratification, but it's a, roughly speaking a sort of discrete bit of information. And then there's a continuous bit of information, which is a rule which associates to every section of this constructible sheaf a uh, pair of a line bundle together with a section of that line bundle. So, you know, generalized Cartier divisor, if you like. OK, and, and of course, you know, this is really happening sort of locally. So for every open set, there should be such an association and, you know, should be compatible with all the other structures. So, OK, you know, what the hell is this? What am I, you know, what am I doing here? So let me just give you an example. So if you have some variety X and some smooth divisor, it doesn't even have to be smooth, but let's just say a smooth divisor, um, then there's something called a divisorial log structure on X. And what it looks like is generically, uh, so, so this constructible sheaf M bar X is just the sheaf given by the natural numbers supported along the divisor D. Okay, so everywhere else it's zero, and then I have this sort of torsion sheaf supported along the divisor. And then this rule takes the you know this so this this sheaf has a sort of unique generator local to d which is just the element one and it just sends it to the equation cutting out the divisor okay so x of d s of d so this is a this is one example this is not the only example of a log structure there are other examples that are important um but you know for for today this will be the main one that i'm going to talk about um so notice that if i'm looking so okay let me just show the picture so if i'm looking at a log stable map then you know I, I fix some divisor on my target 
uh, but my source curve has a, has a marking, right? And, and that marking can also be viewed of as a divisor on the source curve. So I can take this divisorial log structure on both the source and the target, right? And it looks something like this. So I have a copy of the natural numbers here and I have a copy of the natural numbers here and everywhere else this, this, this constructible sheet just vanishes, okay? So this is roughly speaking what a log stable map looks like. And of course, in order to enhance, you know, I mean, there's some extra structure on the source and target, and I need this map to uh, talk to that structure, right? So I need to enhance this to a map of log schemes. And so what I need, first of all, is a map on the on the pullback, right? So I can pull back this sheaf from here to here, and I need a morphism like this. In particular, if I if I restrict that morphism to the to the marking on the source curve, then I just get a map from the natural numbers, right? So sorry, so I'm assuming now that this marking is mapped into the divisor, which means that if I look at the stalk here, the marking is just the 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 stalk at the target along the divisor. So that's a copy of the natural numbers, and it maps into the natural numbers. Um, and of course, this is just given by some some number, right? I just have to decide where to send one here, and we think of that number as the tangency order, okay? And why do we think about that? You know, what what has that got to do with the with the original map itself, with the map and underlying schemes? Well, the point is that this this enhancement that I'm taking also needs to be compatible with the line bundle section pairs, right? So this so the the sort of the generator here corresponded to the equation defining the divisor, and the generator here corresponded to the equation defining the marking. And so this compatibility ensures that in the case where the curve is, is you know, not mapped inside D, um, that this number here, this map here, agrees with the true tangency. But the point is that now, because we have this extra data, the data is well-defined everywhere. So even when the curve falls inside the divisor, that number is still sitting there and you can still read it off. Okay, it's part of the geometry. So this gives you a way to, uh, to make sense of tangency orders, even in this kind of degenerate uh, setup. Okay, so 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 the upshot is that we get a we get a, a proper, compact, virtually smooth moduli space of log stable maps. And um, doing intersection theory on this space will produce enumerative counts in the same way as doing intersection theory on the space of stable maps produce enumerative counts. And these are called log gram of Witten invariants. Okay, so I'll just, just say a little bit about the history here. So this this really goes back to a lecture of Siebert in the early sort of noughties, but the project was sort of unrealized for a while because various techniques like log deformation theory and so on hadn't really been developed. Um, and so then sort of more recently, I guess in, in the last decade or so, these four authors, ACGS as we call them, have developed um, a lot of the foundations of the theory. Um, but, but since then it's really expanded in multiple directions and there's now really a sort of industry, I guess, of people who are working uh, on, on, on this stuff. And uh, there are relations, for example, there's a lot of tropical geometers who, who are working here now because there's relations to tropical curve counting, degeneration formulae, mirror symmetry, and, and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the subject has been sort of growing, at, at least certainly in the sort of few years that I've been a part of it. Um, so I'll just say one thing here. So um, the introduction of these log structures has, has really opened the way for new techniques to enter the subject. So I told you that part of the, the data of a log structure was this, this, this constructible sheaf. And of course, this constructible sheaf gives me a stratification of my space. And you should think of this stratification as analogous to the to the orbit stratification of a toric variety. And indeed, there is a kind of well-defined sense in which you can think of a log scheme as having locally the structure of a toric variety. And this is a philosophy that is very um, that has borne a lot of, fr of fruit. So the idea is, you know, we know that I can understand toric varieties by looking at their fans. And in log geometry, I can associate to every log scheme an object called the tropicalization. This is some combinatorial piecewise linear sort of object. And it's analogous to the fan of a toric variety. And the idea is that you can import techniques that you have from toric geometry into this more general context and use that to study uh, to study things that you just wouldn't be able to understand otherwise. So to just give two examples of this, um, subdivisions of the tropicalization correspond to birational modifications of the target. Okay, so this is uh, something that's well known in the context of toric varieties. Um, another thing that's well known is that if I have piecewise linear functions on the tropicalization on the fan, they correspond to Cartier divisors on X. Okay, so these are both, um, you know, things that generalize to the setting of log schemes, and they've been very useful. So these have been used, um, you know, in, in 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 many works to to prove things that I think we wouldn't have been able to prove if we didn't have access to this kind of combinatorial dictionary. Um, so the point, sorry, so okay, I should have said this before. So the point being that. That in log gram of Witten theory, um, not only the 
you know, the curve and the target, but also the moduli space itself carries a log structure almost tautologically. So you can replace X here for your moduli space, and then you can understand the geometry of the moduli space using this kind of tropical um, correspondence. Okay, so anyway, so so that's sort of a, I guess, a brief sort of overview of what, what's going on in log geometry. And now, yeah, I guess in the last sort of 10 minutes or so, I'll talk about, uh, about the project with Lawrence, but maybe I'll just pause if there are any comments. Is there a way that I can see? Is everyone still there? Oh, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so um, so as I said, this is uh, this is joint work with uh, with Lawrence Barrett, um, and again, it's really it's really inspired by a very classical problem. So the setup is you fix some smooth cubic in P two, and what we want to do is we want to study rational degree d curves or maybe stable maps. I'll be a bit cagey about which one I want to think about in the plane meeting e in a single point. Okay, and of course, if I'm meeting E in a single point, then I must meet it with maximal tangents the order, namely 3D in this case. Okay, um, so this is a problem in enumerative geometry, and I expect, you know, I expect to find finitely many. So let me just say why. Why do I expect to find finitely many? So rational degree D curves move in a 3D minus one dimensional family, and imposing, uh, you know, maximal tangency is a co-dimension 3D minus one condition. You can think of it as requiring 3D points to come together to one point. OK, so that's why I only expect to find finitely many such curves. And as usual, in enumerative geometry, you want to try and count them. OK, and there's, you know, given what I've told you so far, there's at least two ways that you can think about this. So one way is a sort of classical count, meaning, you know, honest, embedded, you know, integral rational curves. OK, just literally curves in P2 defined by an equation which intersect E in a single point. And the other way is via these moduli spaces of log stable maps via these log Gromov of Witten invariants. OK, so there are these two sort of complementary ways that you can think about this. And I just want to point out that these numbers, the numbers you get from these two approaches are not the same. OK, and we'll see why they're not the same very shortly. So let's just start. OK, so we'll start with the case degree equal one. So hopefully most of you know this. Um, so if I give you a smooth cubic in the plane, it has exactly nine flex lines. Right, so these are lines that only intersect the cubic in a single point. Um, this is a very nice, I guess, exercise in studying line bundles on elliptic curves and things like that. Okay, there are precisely nine flex lines, and in this case, it turns out that the, in the simple example, the log Gromov Witten variant is also nine. So let me say what that means. I have this moduli space of log stable maps, which is determined by this initial kind of discrete data, and in this case, it, that moduli space just consists of nine isolated points, right? And those points are, are really parameterizing the flex lines. To be slightly more precise, they're really parameterizing morphisms from a P1 on into P2, whose image is the flex line. Okay, but there, there's no extra choices involved here. So this is an example where the numbers are the same. Um, what about degree two? So in degree two, it turns out, and I'm, I'm not going to justify this too much, um, but but this was known, I think, for I don't actually. So, so certainly this is contained in a paper of Takahashi from the 90s, but it, it may have been known earlier. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's known that there are precisely 27 smooth conics meeting this E, this, this cubic E in a single point. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at the space of log stable maps, something funny happens. So of course, a smooth conic in P2 is just isomorphic to P1. Okay, so I can, if I have a smooth conic, I can just find a map from P1 to P2, some embedding with whose image is that conic. And so these will appear in the space of log stable maps, and that's all fine. But something else happens. Something that happens is, if you remember, I had these flex lines from before. And if I have a flex line, I can take a double cover. So the flex line is just a P1. I can take a double cover of that P1, which is ramified over the intersection point with the elliptic curve. And that, if you think about what it means for a morphism to be tangent to the elliptic curve, you'll find that that's actually that's a degree two map to um, P2, which has the correct tangency condition. So this moduli space of log stable maps, it has these 27 points, and then it has these nine components which are corresponding to double covers. Okay, and these components actually have moduli because there's a choice. If I'm having a double cover of P1 over P1, there's a choice, which is in this case the choice of the other branch point. OK, so there's so this moduli space looks like sort of nine lines and then 27 points. OK. So the picture, yeah, right. So the picture is something like this. So these are these 27 conics and then and then there are these nine double covers of, a, of, of, of the flex line. And it turns out that each of these contribute three quarters to the invariant. So let me just say a bit what I mean by that. 
So this is really an excess intersection calculation. Okay, so it's very analogous to what we had right at the beginning, where we had these double lines which were appearing in our intersection that we didn't want to in, that we didn't want to appear. And so, you know, there there was some contribution to the integral coming from that larger locus of double lines. In this case, it's the locus of double covers. The geometry is very similar. And you just needed to calculate that integral, okay? And that calculate that contribution. So in this case, this is due to gross Pando, Pando, and Siebert, and it turns out the number is three quarters. So the log of written variant is made up of these two contributions. This is coming from these nice isolated points, these coming from these sort of bad components. And the total number you get is this, this rational number, 135 over four. And that's the invariant in this case. It's very different from the classical invariant, which is 27. Um, okay, so this is a general phenomenon. So the, the grand Britain variant is made up of contributions from different components, okay? And some of these components will represent curves in the classical sense, like in this case, these smooth conics, and other components of the moduli space will represent more degenerate objects, such as these double covers, okay? And a big kind of, I guess a big, you know, I guess the name of the game really is to try to separate out these contributions and understand them individually. But you might ask at this point, well, if the Grand Britain variant has all this horrible stuff in it, why don't I just do things classically? What's the point of even thinking about this? And the answer is that the Grand Britain variants actually are easier to calculate than the classical counts. Okay, somehow the fact that they have these degenerate objects is is really a consequence of the recursive structure of these moduli spaces. Okay, and it's that recursive structure which makes them easy to calculate. So you sort of have to choose: either you have all these bad contributions and you can calculate things or you remove the bad contributions, but then it's gonna be harder to calculate things, okay? So in this case, for instance, I have these invariants of P2 E, and they're a closed formula, formulae for these invariants. There is a closed formula for these invariants for all degrees, okay? So this is really due to Gatman and I guess some uh, some precursor work of Takahashi as well. So we know the answer to this to this, this enumerative problem on the gromov witten side, but the question is, can we, can we from the gromov witten side work back and, and sort of extract the classical solution and this is less clear so the game is can we unravel the individual contributions can we deduce the classical counts from the gromov witten counts okay so a lot of people have been working on this um yeah so i've already mentioned nobuyoshi takahashi gross pandora van der various people and you know it's still an active area of research i mean these two papers that i'm referencing here came out you know last year and this year so you know still people who are thinking about this um you know a lot but i think so far the uh the, the verdict's still out i don't think um, that there's really a, let me put it this way, there's not a general method as yet to unravel these classical counts from the Grom of Witten counts. And I don't think the structure of the classical counts is really well known until this point. There's still a lot that we don't understand, even in this very simple example. Um, okay, so with that kind of background, let me, yeah, in the last kind of five minutes or so, talk about um, what we're doing. So, so so the situation that we're thinking about is, so we start with this smooth cubic E and we think, okay, what happens if I degenerate this to the toric boundary in P2, right? So I can degenerate this to a union of coordinate lines. So if I had a curve, which was tangent to E, then it's gonna degenerate along with E, okay? And the question is, what do I get in the limit, right? So you imagine I have some tangent curve over here in the general fiber, I degenerate, and the question is what happens here, okay? So the first thing that you notice is that if I have some degenerating family of tangent curves, right? So I have some tangent curve CT generating to C naught, then whatever I get on the central fiber, C naught has to be contained inside the toric boundary. Okay, so it has to be contained inside this triangle in P2. So, so why is that true? If that wasn't true, then it would have to intersect it in at least two points, right? Because the intersections of the three components are empty. Sorry, I mean, the total intersection of the components is empty. So if it wasn't contained in it, it would have to intersect it in at least two distinct points. And then the same thing would be true on the general fiber after I smooth, okay? So whatever you end up with here has to be contained inside um, the toric boundary inside the cycle of lines. And then you see there's a few different possibilities given by the degree of the curve over each component. So for example, in degree two, uh, if my my you know toric boundary looks something like this, then you know I could be for example have a degree two you know double line basically supported inside this person, or a double line supported here or here, or I could have some sort of split lines. Okay, so there's various ways that you can imagine your curve degenerating. So here's a question. So in in the degree two case, we saw that there are 27 smooth conics in the general fiber. So the question is how many of them limit to a sort of double line, and how many of them limit to a split? conic two lines here okay and you know this is a very innocuous question it seems very simple but 
I don't think it's necessarily very uh, very obvious what the answer should be. Okay, so in in this case, I think actually for what it's worth, it probably is possible to to answer this question using classical methods. But as soon as you go, for example, to degree three, the corresponding question is even more complicated, and I really don't know any way of answering the question classically. So okay, so what's our approach? So our approach is to consider the, the corresponding problem in gromov witten theory on the gromov witten side. Okay, so there's a family, so I have this family of cubics, which are degenerating to the to the toric boundary, and I get a corresponding family of moduli spaces, right, over A1. So the general fibers of these moduli spaces are, are all basically the same. They're the moduli space of log stable maps to the cubic. It doesn't really matter what the cubic is as long as it's smooth. They're all basically the same. Um, but the central fiber is a bit different. The central fiber actually is the whole space of maps to the boundary. OK, so just as before we saw curves living in the boundary on the central fiber, now we see maps to the boundary on the central fiber. And this breaks into components according to the, de to the degree splitting, just as it did previously. Right. So if I have a degree two map to this boundary, you know, I want to record the degree supported over each component. And in, in particular, this, this is usually a very big moduli space compared to the moduli spaces on the general fibers. And so what we want to do and what we do is we, we use log deformation theory, so our understanding of the deformation theory of these objects, to construct a class, a cohomology class, if you like, on the central fiber, whose integral gives you the log gromov witten invariant of the general fiber. So this is some sort of conservation of number principles. You have some class on the general fiber that you understand. You want to construct a class on the central fiber, which sort of continues it. And once you've done this, um, you get a refinement of the log gromov witten invariance because you have a bunch of components. Your central fiber breaks up into a bunch of pieces, and you can ask how much does each of those pieces contribute. Okay, so this gives you somehow new information. And so what we do, and so sorry, so I guess on this page I'm basically sweeping more or less the entire paper under the rug. So there's a lot of you know sort of technical machinery that you need here, and I guess like some some nice geometry as well. Um, we compute these contributions. This uses torus localization and tropical techniques and so on. You get a bunch of numbers, okay? And now the idea is now that we've solved, so 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 you know the, the original question was how many curves end up you know on 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 this component or on this component, and we basically solved the analogous problem on the gromov witten side. So now the question is, can we uh, can we unravel it and go back? So yeah, sorry, I know I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm almost uh, I'm almost done. So let's go in the degree two case. So this is a picture here. And what this picture is, is it's, it's a picture of the moduli spaces of log stable maps on the general fiber on the left and on the central fiber on the right. OK, so the general fiber here, we had these 27 smooth conics and we had these nine double covers, each contributing three quarters. OK, so if I sum these two numbers, I get the gromov witten invariant. Now, of course, a double cover of a line must limit to a double cover of a line. That's no big deal. On the other hand, the question which we originally had, which was working out these question marks, right? So how do the smooth connects degenerate? And so the point is, because we've been able to do intersection theory on the central fiber, we know we now know the contributions of these components on the central fiber. So these numbers, these green numbers here, we calculate these using some uh, you know, various sort of intersection theoretic techniques. Okay, and it turns out in this case, it's 18 and 63 over four. Okay, these are the contributions. And now, of course, the point is that once you know what happens on the right hand side, you can unravel to work out what these red question marks had to be. OK, so in this case, uh, they were 18 and 9. So of the original 27 smooth conics, 18 of them limit to split curves and nine of them limit to double lines. OK, um, and of course, so you can ask similar questions in higher degree. So I'll, I'll just show you the degree three case. Um, there are actually problems in degree four and higher, but I won't talk too much about that. So that in degree three, the general fiber looks like this. There's 20, 234 rational cubics, which are tangent to the to the elliptic curve. Um, and then there's also these triple covers of lines, nine of them again for the nine flex lines, and they each contribute 10 over nine. And again, of course, these must limit like this. A line must go to a line that I have now these three question marks. Um, but again, you see that once I know the contributions here, I'm going to be able to work back and work out these question marks here. So in this case, these, this is the answer. So we get 27 uh, for the sort of, uh, what's the word, cycle of lines, and then a sort of double line, you need a line, turns out that contributes 162, and then turns out this contributes 55, and so you can fill in these, go back and fill in these numbers. So this gives a sort of, I guess, a nice answer to a classical problem, um, which, yeah, as far as I know, there isn't any way to, at least certainly hasn't been written down any way to do this classically. Although, you know, if there's someone in the audience who can see how to do this, uh, you know, classically, then I'd be very happy to to know that. 
So um, yeah, so I think I'll stop there. So.